This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Shay Obana. How you doing, Shay? I'm good. I'm feeling good. I'm excited. Obviously, it's a big week, and it's it's been a long time coming. So yeah, it's, I'm I'm feeling pretty good. So yeah, man. I, first of all, congratulations on being accepted into Sundance. Uh, writing mm-hmm. a film that's accepted a Sundance, and so it's, it's one of the better ones I've seen at the festival this year so far. So, uh, oh, really, really congrats! But before we get into the magical lottery ticket that is the Sundance acceptance, and we'll call, talk all about mm-hmm. that, how did you get started in the business, man? In the business, um, I'd say I officially got started in the business. Um, my first job, job. Um, official job was in 2019 um, when I got my first job in a writer's room as a staff writer on the limited series uh, Evil, uh, which is about Evil Knievel, uh, which I think technically is still in development. Um, <laughs> but I, I'd say my, my start, I, I came out to L.A. about 12 years ago, uh, 2009. I got into AFI, um, the American Film Institute. Sure. And um, when I got in, I got accepted as a screenwriter. The way AFI is, if anybody knows anything about American Film Institute, it's a conservatory model. So you you work in your discipline, in your craft. So they accept like 28 directors, 28 writers, 28 producers, and 28 cinematographers, and also production designers and editors. And the first year, you all working together on your short films. Um, and then the second year, you work primarily on the thesis film. And as the writers, we're like working on like, you know, writing a, you know, a couple of features. There was, I didn't even, like when I got to AFI, I, I didn't. I hadn't had a plan on, be, on being in television. Um, so I, I took a TV class my second year, and that just like kind of like really changed. And at the time, it was like the golden age of television, like Mad Men and Breaking Bad are popping off. And so that was kind of like, that was a huge, um, had a huge effect on me as a writer. That was when I decided I also want to work in TV as well. Um, but when I got to AFI, I had a plan which was to, and this is something I've heard from uh, people that I respect, which is like network across. Um, so when I got to AFI, my plan was to like find my tribe. Um, so when I got there, I, I immediately tried to connect and collaborate with people that I that I whose work I respected and who were really cool people. And so when I got there, when I was there, uh, me and uh, like three other writers and a director formed a collective, and we just started like obviously we were working at AFI, but you know on our own we would be writing like shorts, sketches. And we were, like, doing this stuff while at AFI. And then right after AFI, we were still working. We were, like, you know, put, do our own little projects. And we even did, like, a web series. Um, and so, like, those – they don't tell you this in school. But, you know, it's, it's, it's generally when you get out of school. Nobody's offering you a, a $100 million feature or a, a $5 feature to write or direct. And you, and the TV industry isn't going to, like, hey, we got this staffing job on Succession. Come get it like that. <laughs> It don't really work like that. So we are we were like grinding right out of school, making our own stuff and kind of like getting better and um, and working on our own on our own material. And that kind of got us noticed by different entities that kind of helped me skip a few steps. Like I didn't I didn't I was never a writer's assistant. I was never really a PA. I never really did the intern thing. And so like just kind of like working in that collective gave gave me the opportunity to work and to get my stuff seen. Um, and also get better, um, and ultimately like kind of take a different path than, than probably most people take. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was working in that collective that we, we pulled all our resources together and eventually made an an independent feature, um, really low budget independent independent feature called Low Life, which Mm -hmm. was a kind of a, a a small crime film. It's an ensemble crime (laughs) film. I even acted it as well. And that was kind of the thing that really kind of like, push things forward i think it was the thing that ultimately led me to get representation mm-hmm. and ultimately led me it ultimately led me to meeting julian and ultimately led me to god to god's country so so you mean to tell me when you show up to la they don't just uh hand you a ticket to go to the studio and just start writing and get paid they don't do that it was the most surprising thing ever because i really thought <laughs> it was gonna be like shane black like i was just like yo man when is when am I going to get my, like... $3 million my, spec. My front page, like, my $5 million against the, the, the $10 million advance. Like, wait, it's, it's supposed to come immediately after I graduate. Why because because they they did not recognize your genius early on. I, th- I think we all have this problem. Yes. We, I've 
absolutely all have this problem and it needs to be rectified. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question, man. No, I find it really interesting that you started off, uh, you were smart. I don't know if you were smart enough, but you, you figured it out that doing it alone, especially as a writer, because writer is a very solitary profession and writers generally don't, you know, I've, I've, I'm a writer. I've worked with writers. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes you've got really personable writers and other writers yeah. who just are Charlie Kaufman sitting in the corner. Uh, yeah. And and there, so writers don't generally think about a collective or about networking or about putting together a team or a group of people of like-minded people to try to get something made. And that is so valuable because I think what you just said is if you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have been able to get your first feature made. You wouldn't get your, your uh, you wouldn't have been able to get your representation, so on and so forth. So it was this group that you kind of all lifted yourselves up. I mean, look, Spielberg, Lucas, um, Coppola, Scorsese, they all did it back in the day. They they got this group together and they helped each other out. And it was crazy. I didn't even know that. Like I had already came in with that mentality, but I didn't even know that those guys did that until I like watch like the Spielberg document. I had heard about it before, but I had never actually seen it. Like actually seeing images of Spielberg on the Scarface set with like a like in the in the big shootout with the, like a mask on. I was like Spielberg like worked like B camera on that. You know what I mean? So like <laughs> even they the masters were thinking of that. You know what I mean? So like yeah, I it was just it was something inherent. And I agree as writers, we're not necessarily like it seems antithetical to the way we work to be like collaborative. But what happened, like, it was AFI for me going to a place like the American Film Institute or, I mean, I think any any really good graduate, undergraduate film school, even graduate program, if, if you go, like, everybody's on the same level as you and generally everybody's pretty good. They're just undervalued at that point because you're young or whatever. That's the time to, like, build those relationships and build those collaborations and not try to go, you know, network to go, go write a query letter to Spielberg or something like that because... <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's they're not on your like I hate to say it but like it's it's levels to this and they're they're at a different level. Come up with the people that that are like grinding out there with you and it's 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 super rewarding personally, but it gives you you pool resources. You know what right. I mean? You pool, right. Money, talent, time. You're all on the same connections. Level, yeah. Yeah, connections. It's, it's one of my biggest pieces of advice. I'm not a big on advice, but like that's. A big piece of advice that I would give to any really crafts person, but specifically like writers and directors, like at least with like cinematographers and other people, like you, they're they're working. Like all my friends are the DPs and we're editors, constantly working. You know what I mean? And like with the writers and directors, it's a little bit tougher to crack. You know, nobody, like I said, nobody's offering you like a film. Nobody's offering you a TV show. So you have to like find ways to work um, and network and build and kind of build yourself as a creator. Yeah. I think I think you know being in the town like LA, man. If you don't have friends, if you don't have relationships, you can't get anywhere, man. You just can't, and that's something that they don't teach you. They don't teach you that at school. They, you know, like you don't understand what the value is of those relationships because all of my all of my jobs when I first got to LA, man, were friends of a. Fr- I I got to LA. I knew two people, a DP. Mm-hmm. I knew two DPs. That was mm-hmm. it. And yeah. within, I don't know, within two or three months, I was nonstop working as an editor, mm-hmm. colorist, post supervisor. And then it just started to build on itself because you're like, oh, this guy's really good. Why don't you do this? But it was all about those building those relationships, going to these little parties and like, you know, introducing mm-hmm. yourself and all this kind of stuff. Man, do you know, I'll tell you a quick story. You know, Barry Sonnenfeld, right? Uh, and yep. the, the Coen brother. You know, Barry was the DP on Blood Simple. For, yes. Yeah. Do mm-hmm. you know how he got that job? He told me when he was on the show. He said, "Hey, man, listen. Uh, how'd you, I go? How'd you get involved with the Cohen brother?" He goes, "I went to this party. We. I was young. I finished. I just got finished doing porn because that was how he paid off his first camera." That's yes, right. I think I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then he's like, "I'm sitting in the corner, and I look over, and then in the other corner, there's this tall, lanky dude." So I walk over to him. Hey, what's your name? He goes, "I'm Joel." He goes, "Oh, I'm Barry." He's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "I'm shooting this thing this weekend." Uh, we're shooting this trailer for this movie that we're trying to get raise money money for, uh, Blood Simple. He's like, well, I got a 60 millimeter camera. He goes, you're hired. That was it. <laughs> that was, I'm like, really? And that was yeah. the way, and that's how Barry Sonnenfeld and Joel, Col- Joel and Ethan took off. But it was about being, you got to put yourself out there, man. You're absolutely you, especially right. Especially as a writer. Especially because like, as writers, like you said, like a lot of us are like, some of us are Charlie Kaufman people, but a lot of us are not really super like the social butterflies. Some of us are, obviously. But you got to like, you got to get out, especially in LA. 
No, you yeah. got to get out there. You got to you got to network. You got to meet people. You can be the best writer in the world, but if you're just sitting in the corner writing like these amazing scripts that nobody's really getting a chance to see, and a lot of times they're not just they're, they're hiring you, not just the work. They're literally they're hiring you. Like they they want to be in business with you, and nobody's gonna know that if you're like if you're just sitting in your room all day and you're not getting out and you're not meeting people, or at least if you're not a big social person, connect and collaborate with people who are who can kind of like work those avenues for you or at least put you in those situations to like be the icebreaker in those social situations. You know would I mean? you would you at the beginning of your career, if you found a if you found a director or a producer and you guys are just starting out, I'm like, listen man, if you get this produced, uh, I know you don't got any money, pay me something on the back end. Would you rather have something that's been produced and no money at the beginning or a little bit of money and no and nothing gets produced? The, the 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 former like 100 percent like i am i am 100 percent like the person that that's the way i, I we came up like mm-hmm. very little money but it's being produced that is that has a higher value to the industry than than having money and not really having anything out there that's always been the way I, that's that's kind of the way the people that i looked up to that's kind of the way they came up you know people like really like just like let's get it made even we'll We'll make our budget our aesthetic. You know what I mean? Like we'll make our resources our aesthetic because we're that good as creatives. So yeah, I'm 100 percent in that camp of just like not having a lot of money and getting out there and producing something. Now, was there a film that lit your fire to come into this ridiculous business? <laughs> I I don't know if there was a specific because the, the films that are the films that I love are not. Well, I mean, for me, for me, like my favorite film of all time is, is Heat. I'm a Michael Mann fan. So Man. like, I just like, and I like to write in the crime. I, I love like crime films and really elevated, you know, crime cinema. And so for me, like, that's like, that's the film where I was just like, man, this is like, this is like, you can make something that just like sits with you forever that you constantly revisit. So I don't, I don't know if I would say that was the film that got me in the industry. You know, what's funny <laughs> this is go like as a kid, I always say this. This is going to be funny. So Rocky IV was the first movie I saw as a kid that I was just like, yo, it, it, I, I want to do this. <laughs> this is weird as shit. Hey, hey, don't, don't, hey, man, listen, I just, had a, I just had a filmmaker on who made an entire movie about the opening of Rocky III in, Sta- in Staten Island and how it affected him and his, yeah. his friends and stuff like that. Yeah. Dude, Rocky IV, dude, I, look, there's, I, I, you could turn on Rocky IV, right? I literally, you know what? You want to hear something funny? Yesterday. In traveling through YouTube, the end fight sequence from Rocky IV came up. Like, hey, do you want to watch yeah. the end fight? I'm like, yes. And I just yeah. sat there and watched <laughs> Drago and Rocky fight. I've seen that fight a million times. But yeah. there's something about what Stallone did, man, and 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 with that character and the like with Mr. T and and, and Rocky and, and and three and four specifically. Um, oh yeah, three and four specifically. Two I enjoyed. One is a, a masterpiece. Five we don't talk about, and then Rocky Balboa was like, I can't believe he did it again. Like it was like, what? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. Like I, I am a yeah. I I'm a I'm a Rocky I'm a Rocky apologist. Obviously, when when the funny thing when Creed came out, I got mad because I was like, why did I write that? I'm like, <laughs> of Apollo. What are you talking about? Like, I thought that I did. I was so bad about that. And then I was like, <laughs> championing it, like you know, from the moment I saw it. Um. Creed 2 was a different story because I felt like I, I, in Creed 2 I was rooting for uh, Drago's kid I was like no 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 I was like I need Drago's kid to win in, in Creed because Drago's, <laughs> Drago's kid had it a little bit rougher than I than would agree with you I would, ag- I would agree with you man like yeah you can't have was like, Michael B Michael B's often you know in, in the mansion he's like man I, lo- I lost it I'm like no you have not look at you <laughs> You're good. If I would have done Creed two, I would have He would have lost in Creed two, and then Creed three would have been the rematch. You know what I mean? That would have been like the way I would have done it. But long story short, Rocky, Rocky three and Rocky four, they get reduced as like camp, the campiest, the campy ones. Oh, but there's so much fun. But like, don't, 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 like seriously, don't sleep on it. Like the stakes are so. Like, I mean, the stakes in Rocky four couldn't be higher. It's literally like we're trying to stop a nuclear war. If Rocky. When Rocky beats Drago, he like destroys. He destroys the Soviet Union. Like, what are you talking about? So, like, I'm joking around. I'm, I'm being, it's, but I love like for me as a kid watching that. It was just like that was when like you're dreaming. You like I'm, I remember like watching that, putting popcorn in my mouth and play boxing with my buddy. And that was when I was just like, 
yo, I want this feeling that I have right now. I want to give this feeling to other people. You know what I mean? So that, that's, that's probably the movie that I remember that had the most effect on me. You see, and that's the funny. I love that you said that, man. This feeling I want to give to other people. That's a really yeah. good place to come from as a writer, as a creative, that you're trying to give back through your art to your community in one way, shape, or form, to the world in one way, shape, or form, as opposed to being a more of an egocentric place of like, I need to be big, I need to be this or that. It, 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 those guys, I've met those guys. It's hard, man. It, it, this business is so damn hard in general. Yep. And if you think, I know you've met them, uh, you know, guys who think they're, guys and gals who think that, you know, they're the last Coke in the desert, and they think that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know and you're just like, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, man. You're doing it for the wrong reason. You won't make it. No, 100%. Like, for me, it is about, like, I always say this. I pray at the temple of the story. I'm a writer. You know what I mean? So, like, ego, you know, this happened in God's country. Like, for me, like, my ego is shaped at the door, especially when I'm collaborating on something that's a personal project with people that I actually love. You know what I mean? People that I consider, like, you know, uh, contemporaries or friends or whatever you want to call it. I leave, it ain't about the, it's just about like, I just like, I want to be, I want to give some kid or some adult or whoever, like the feeling that I got from watching, you know, from watching Rocky for the first time or watching Heat 75,000 times, you know what I mean? I want to give people that feeling. And so that's why I do this. Now, I got to ask you, man, because I know there's a lot of young writers listening. How did you keep going all those years that when doors weren't opening, man, doors weren't opening, things weren't happening the way you wanted to, and you just kept your head down and you just kept going. If I may use a Rocky uh, quote, you, you know, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's so tr it's so true. What did you do to 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 make it through those? Because we're not talking about months. We're talking about years. Mm -hmm. So there there mm -hmm. must have been something that you did that made you wake up every morning like, man, I got to write or I got to do this and I got to keep going. What was mm -hmm. that thing? I think it was kind of two things. One thing was like, this is going to sound really like hokey, but you just have to get to a point where you're like there's no like you have to you have to you have to actually define yourself and declare your, that you are a writer, that you are a director. Like, a lot of people, they, like, when, it, it is a mental thing. Like, you'll be, you'll be in conversations and you'll be like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm studying to be a director or I'm, I'm working toward, you know, making my first, you know, you have to mentally, like, tell yourself, even if you're working, if, if, you're, if you're working a day job at a grocery store or wherever, you have to tell yourself mentally that I am a writer. You know, that, like, you, you, you have to approach... Whatever that day job is, you have to approach it as it's literally what I do to pay the bills. But like what I am is a writer. So if that means like I have to like if I have uh, an earlier shift at, at my job, that means when I get off, I'm writing for the rest of the day. Or I get up if I have a I get up in the morning and I write. So like the intention is that my day and my focus is on my craft and everything else kind of like comes second to that. And then like the other thing is like what I mentioned earlier about if you have a tribe. If you have a group, y'all hold each other down. Like, if, like one of you might be having like a lean time, and the other one, like you, we, you're constantly. For me, what helped me move forward was like I had these other people that I was, for lack of a better word, like beholden to. Like we all worked together, and it was just like, even if in our leanest times we weren't making any money, it felt like I was working because even even us just going out on the weekend and making like just the stupidest sketch, you know, by Dodger Stadium or something like that, that felt, it feels the same, that felt the same way as I felt making God's Country with, with, with Tandy Way Newton, you know what I mean? It's just like having that group that you're, 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 you're in it together, it really kind of insulates you from those really hard times. And yeah, it takes years, but those years, they, they tend to like fly by because you're making progress. You're constantly moving forward. Like set, be intentional and set kind of like, set a plan. Like, you know, like, okay, well, this month we're going to make, you know, this little short scene. And then, you know, in the summer, let's make like a short film. We'll make a sketch. And then let's start, let's, let's work. Maybe we'll do a, a web series, you know, like, um, and if you like, just always like kind of plan and always kind of like move forward, take incremental steps um, with the next thing. That's kind of what got me, got me through my kind of like, because like I said, I didn't have a, a traditional, the most traditional route to where I got. That kind of helped me power through that non-traditional path. And and then that's how you got Low Life made. 
Like Low Life was made specifically by you getting your group together. Like we're gonna go make a feature. And literally the way Low Life happened was it was like it was like almost like um, a huge collection of all these sketches that we worked. Like a lot of the sketches that we had worked on, some of them were baked into the script. Some of the characters we had worked on, we had they were in other sketches, so it was kind of like expanding those characters. So it kind of became this weird universe, almost like an MCU, but you know our MCU. Of, of characters and it just kind of like came together in this one uh film and obviously like we were inspired we, we were inspired by tarantino the scorsese's of the world we all grew up you know watching like those like auteur you know the shane blacks that that genre storytelling in 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 specific space so it's like the we were very much influenced by the stuff that we were really into like you know the 80s the 80s big blockbuster stuff but also like you know Bad Lieutenant, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were constantly like, you know, pushing each other and and and, and moving forward. That's awesome, man. That that's great, and I, I hope I hope everyone listening takes a lesson, man, because it's yeah. it's almost like a mastermind. Like it's a mastermind that is like you're working with a group of people that you're constantly uh, helping each other, but you're also keeping yourself accountable to each other. And even when you're not working, quote unquote, and not making money. You guys are still working on something on the weekends, or you're still working on something. You just can you keep you keep exercising the muscle, if you will. Yep, that was what it's about. That's what the collective was for me. It was constantly because if you don't like because those years are so lean. If you don't exercise that muscle, if you're not out there putting in the work, then yeah, like it's gonna it's gonna be a longer process. Or all you're doing is you're just really setting yourself up because it's so it's so difficult to break in this. We've all heard the stories, but if you like, if you're really out there exercising that muscle, people will see it. People will find you. The industry will find you. Um, if you're out there like doing like if, the way that I approach things, that that's how it worked out. For me. So when you, when did you dec- like literally declare yourself a writer? Because I I know for me when I sat down and started writing my first script and my first book. You know, mm-hmm. it took me a minute. There's a lot of imposter syndrome that happens in our business. Yep. A lot of imposter syndromes. I've I've talked to the mm-hmm. Oscar winners who still freaking have it. I'm like, are you right. kidding? Are you like kidding me? Like you just won mm-hmm. an Oscar? They're like, yeah, but I, I I I've had directors who are on set. I'm like, yeah, I feel like security is going to take me off in a day. I'm like, you've yep. made you've made a billion dollars at the box office. Like I know. So it's mm-hmm. a it's a straight thing. So what was it that thing that fear that you had to break through to finally declare yourself like I'm a freaking writer? Because it it is a it is a conscious choice, it is a conscious choice you make. Because I mean, I had to make it personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to go. I mean, I feel like it was right around the time we did Low Life. Um, oh wow. Okay. Because I was literally like, I was like working. I was like, I was literally, and I act in Low Life too. Yeah. So, I'm like working. I'm working a day job. You know, making very little money, but I was, but I'm obviously working with my guys, and it was something about when we finally like, we had worked on Low Life, we had wrote it like a writer's room, and we, it was something about that first day when we started like making it at some CD motel, you know, in Studio City, <laughs> where literally like crime is happening around us. So it was like, it, it was in the air. Like you didn't, we didn't just point the camera and shoot. Like we don't got to make this stuff up. It was around, it was around that moment where it was just like. My bank account, there's nothing in here. Um, I'm waking up at like three in the morning to go walk the set and I'm making no money. But I was like, this is it. I'm doing it. I, that was like it was around that time. Where I was like, you know what? I'm the broke ever been in my life, but I'm a writer. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm literally doing this. And from that point on, the mentality was different. Like obviously, like I didn't come out of low life and immediately get a job. It still took some time. But I, from that moment on. I saw myself as a writer. I saw myself as a creative, and everything else I did, it was just what you got to do to eat. You know what I mean? But yeah, that was it. Was around the time of low life. It's so funny because you said I was the brokest in my life, but I'm a writer. That's a yeah. quote. Yeah. <laughs> sure it's, it's, it's so true. And I saw the tra- I saw your trailer for Low Life, and I was like, I know that I know that motel. I used to drive by it all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that motel's got some history. I don't even know if it's still if it's still around, but like, yeah. That you should... had a history, and it was perfect for Low Life. Oh, no. It's per- yeah, we it's... shot that before. The funny thing is we had shot like, everything coming full circle. We had shot part of a web series there before. So we ended up – we were going to shoot in a different location at Low Life, but we lost that location. Mm-hmm. And that motel was available, so let's go back. You know what I mean? So it was like it was like graduation for us. That's hilarious, man. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you've worked in some writer's rooms, and you've also worked alone 
as a, as a, you know, as, as a feature writer, mm -hmm. how do you, what did you bring from the writer's room into your feature work and vice versa? What did you bring into your feature work from your feature work into the writer's room? Because it's two very different feel dude. I mean, writer's rooms is a completely different environment than you just yeah. sitting down writing. So is there anything you brought from each other to help each other in each other's? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, help me. Like I said, I never, I'd never been a writer's assistant. I had never really been a PA. So I didn't have, professional experience in the writer's room. But because of the collective, for like the past like five years before I got that job, we worked like a writer's room. So a lot of the habits that I saw in a writer's room, I I learned in in working with my guys. So like, but it would help me because like the imposter syndrome, I'm not big, I'm not I'm not like the biggest like pitcher in terms of like I'm constantly like pitching stuff. Mm -hmm. Some people, a lot of people in writer's room, specifically comedy writer's room, that's really what you're doing. And so I, I kind of honed that crap with my guys. I mean, when you're, when you're in a group of guys and, you know, we're like, you know, we're like cracking on each other and it could be really like testosterone, whatever, like you learn to kind of like to pitch and you learn how to like, sometimes you're going to have a bad pitch and it may not work out, but keep, you know, it doesn't, don't stop. Don't let it stop you from, from continuing to move forward. So like it helped me, like when I finally got my first professional writer's room, the reason I was able to get that job and then I was able to kind of like, skip a bunch of step, steps and be successful was because I had honed those skills working with my guys on, on low life. We, we literally met, wrote low life, like, um, like a writer's room. We broke it. We broke story. We assigned each other different sections and we would go off and write our section, bring it back. And then we would like, you know, edit together like a writer's room. So like that helped me to really make that transition, even though I still felt some imposter syndrome, it got me that, that first job, but it also helped me make that transition. Like, a, that was a tough transition. It's like going from, like, it literally is like going from high school to the pros as an athlete. <laughs> and so that helped me, like, being able to, like, have that experience with my guys helped me make that transition. And in terms of going from the writer's room to, to feature, I think it's all about, about process and time management. You know, in a writer's room, the professional writer's room, like, you're constantly working. You, you're working against deadlines. Like, it's got to get done. You know, and um, you, you, you're getting assignments and it's, it's, it's much more about time management. I think in the feature world, specifically when you're working alone, you, you, you generally don't have any like deadlines you're trying to hit or you're just kind of like going with the flow. But working in a writer's room helped me. And I guess you can say specifically with God's Country, um, it really helped with like process and development and breaking story and, and time management. I think those kind of like um, different virtues or whatever you want to call them that's what i kind of took from like the writer's room world and brought it to the feature world now uh before we get into god's country man i need to ask you what was it like getting the phone call or how did you find out that you got into sundance i always love asking these stories <laughs> um julian my partner he got the call and then one day he called me and he was just like so it is like whenever like good things happen it's kind of julian he's like so um there's some news <laughs> and I weirdly had this feeling I was like, this is around the time that I think they start announcing Sunday. So, so kind of like I wasn't like I hate to say this is going to sound really I wasn't like really surprised. It was, it was cool. It was awesome. And it's an awesome feeling. But it's also part of me that just like I was like, man, the work we put in on this particular film, the themes, just like. The people that are involved in it, it felt like it was perfect for Sundays. But you never know. Sometimes these things are political or whatever. You, what mm -hmm, have you. So. Mm -hmm. It still is cool, but yeah, like Julian called me up and was just like, so, news. And then he was like, we got it to Sundance. And it was just like, wow. It, <laughs> I, I definitely had to take a moment to be like, uh, could you repeat that? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And then we like went out like that, me and Julian, when I got grabbed a beer. And then it was kind of us just really reflecting, just really being like, man, this has been like a five-year process. And this is kind of like the culmination of everything. Yeah. How long did it take to get to get the movie off the ground? Um, it took, we, me and Julian met late 2016. We started talking about potentially doing a project early 2017. I think 2018, we went to Montana because I'd never been, like we shot in Montana and the story set in the Mountain West. So he had been before because he had shot, he had made the short version of, of the film. And so he had been, he had shot in Montana before he had familiarity in Montana and his DP Andrew Wheeler, like he lives, he part, he part time lives in Montana. So I had never been. And so 2018, we go to Montana. That was huge on my process, like being able to go and see 
the landscape and see the terrain and kind of see the environment, it helped with, with me to write, you know, to actually write those scenes. A lot of ideas that I came up with, I came up with, I came up with when we were, um, in 2018, we went to go to Montana. So 2018, we go to Montana and we was like, and we started writing the script around that time. And then like, uh, we were going to shoot early 2019 but we just felt like we didn't have enough the, the fi enough financing to, to to actually do the film the way we wanted to do it. So we didn't start shooting until February 2020. So we started talking about the film in 2017, start working on the script like 2018. We don't start shooting to 2020. We Mar but no, but nothing but nothing happened in 2020. So you were just it's a smooth sailing in 2020 for you, right? In production wise. No, we shot. We started shooting. <laughs> February. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You took a second. That's took you a second. <laughs> that's trauma, man. You hit me with the trauma right out. Yeah. So something happened in 2020. Like literally February bar 2020 is when the world just like changed. And we were making our movie at that time, and we had about two weeks left on the schedule. We're literally shooting in a mortuary, and we get the we get the call like, yeah, we got to shut down. You know, Tandy Way's got to go back to, to, to the UK because the UK might shut down. So she's got to get back. And we all had to leave. And it was like, it's just like you have like the best moment of your life. And all of a sudden it becomes the most depressing moment of your life. We didn't go. We literally went back, I think, a year to the day. We went back to finish. Wow. And it was the greatest thing to happen because it made that year when we were home, me and Julian worked on elements of the script. Like we went back to rewriting and we, we worked on elements of the script that we felt there still were issues that we, we we were shooting in 2020 stuff that we noticed like dude, we, this could this could be better. We went back and made those things better, and we ended up making a better film in in 2021. Some things got reshot, and then we added. We, we obviously like finished what we didn't get a chance to when we uh, were there in 2020. That's awesome, man. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Now, um, so you, so you basically you guys just got together and started writing this concept. Can you talk a little bit about the themes of the film? Because I've seen the film. It's a beautiful film. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's. Beautiful, it's haunting, it's, uh, it's definitely dark, uh, mm -hmm. without question. Can you talk a little bit about the themes and how you kind of interweave them into the characters a bit, without giving away too much, obviously? Yeah, well, the thing about myself and Julian is that we're both big fans of the Western genre. Mm -hmm. um, and the way we kind of like broke it down, this is, I think this might be Julian's statement, is that the Western is American, American mythology. America is a relatively young country. And so, like, the Western is, like, our mythology. And also, for us, specifically, the Western, I think, is where America goes to work out its problems. Like, there's a lot of... I, I've written a couple of, like, Westerns, and, like, the cool thing about Westerns is there's there's a, there's themes that you can, like, really explore in Westerns and explore from an interesting perspective. One of them is race. Um, and one of them, obviously, you, you, can, you can explore themes of gender, you can explore themes of inequality, um expansion you know this is the western is just like the genre where you can really do some interesting things so for us we always approach god's country like it was a modern western and for me like for i for obvious reasons like the idea of centering a, a black woman or a marginalized person within the western genre which is like this super american genre and landscape is just that's the dream for me you know what i mean so like for me that was the that was the, the core of it it was just like this is a western and we can like we can approach themes of race and gender inequality and um, you know um, like you know I'm trying to like I'm, I'm trying to think what's the right word when I give the things away, but just like you know themes of like um, sexual assault or mm -hmm. um, we can we we can we can really explore those in this genre, but let's not like let's not focus on them like that's not let's not make these themes. We want to approach it from a subtle, from kind of a subtle perspective. So at the end of the day, it was just like it's a very, it's a really simple story about one character having a dispute with a couple of other characters, but also this character being considered an outsider in mm -hmm. this community. Um, and that's really what the story is. And obviously, there's uh, there's issues and themes of grief that are being um, explored in the film as well. These are also universal themes. That's a cool. And it's another thing is like let's. Even though we're kind of like we're exploring these issues in this particular in this particular project, less like it's born from a place of humanity and kind of like things that feel universal. I think grief is something that we've all experienced or some in some way, shape, or form. So yes. it's important that for me it was important that coming into the film the character is grieving because I feel like 
you're going to initially identify with a person like that because we've all been through it. So that's kind of like, I kind of like went off on a tangent, but for me, it was always like, yes, there's a lot of themes in this film, but let's just approach it specifically from story. Character A wants something, character B is getting in their way, and they got to work it out. Yeah, and you've got um, you've got a, a great actor from Yellowstone in your in your film, mm-hmm. uh, which I think Yellowstone right now is probably the some of the best mm-hmm. television being written right now, without mm-hmm. without question. And if you want to talk about modern western, I mean Taylor, mm-hmm. Taylor don't play. <laughs> He's Mister Modern Western. I'm not gonna lie. Like uh, I've, I've seen, yeah, I, we. I mean, obviously, I watched Wind River. Um, you know, it's obviously like exploring like kind of the same landscape as God's Country. Mm-hmm. Um, Hell or High Water, you know, which he wrote, which is, is probably the best modern Western in the, in the past few years. Mm. Um, yeah, Taylor's got it locked. He knows Texas. He knows, like, the fun. I, I grew up partially, I grew up in suburban, you know, Houston. Oh, okay. But just living in that environment, like, you drive you drive out of town, you drive west, you know what I mean? Or you drive a little bit out of the, outside of the major <laughs> cities. Like, like, that scene in Hell or High Water where, like, they're, like, they're herding the cattle across. I don't know if you remember that. And they're trying to like, and, and like Jeff Bridges is waiting to go around and he says like, it's the, it's the what, the 21st century and I'm herding cattle like from a storm. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's, that's really what it's like. And it is though, that color, those little nuances that that's what makes it feel like a modern Western, you know, like no country for old man is another like great example no. of this. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I love it. I love, I love the genre. Yeah. And I, and I just moved to Austin from LA. So I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is where all the cool kids are hanging out, man. This is where all the cool kids are hanging out. Um, and there's no state tax. But, uh, <laughs> which is... I'm like, from Austin to L.A. Like, I, when, I, when I moved to L.A. in 2009, I came from Austin. So, like, oh, Austin, you? like... Yeah, Austin, Austin is, like, one of the, the places in, in the world that I consider home. Like, I love, I, I love the city. I love Austin. And then you're right, man. You drive outside of Austin about an hour out. You are not in Austin anymore. You're like this is a whole. You're like you're literally in hell or high water. You're in you know you're in Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're just. It is a completely different world. A completely different everything. But uh, mm-hmm. it's it's an it's interesting. It's really interesting. I love absolutely love living here, man. And uh, and I got it's so funny because oh. I got hooked on Yellowstone uh, when mm-hmm. we got here. I was like, oh. I got we got to watch Yellowstone. <laughs> now I'm like a fat, like completely fanatical about Yellowstone and all the stuff that he's doing. But yeah, that's why I was really excited to watch God's Country, man. It's a really great um chapter in the films that are being created in 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 this genre, man. You did a fantastic job. How I got to ask like how did you guys get the financing together for this film and and was it before Tawny or after? How did that work out? How did she get involved with it cuz she's a fairly big star now she's in one of the biggest tv shows uh on hbo and you know she's mm-hmm. she's no joke <laughs> yeah no, no, tandy ways major um so we the thing like julian so julian kind of like was inspired by the way we did low life the way we did low life was like we literally made it for pennies we spread together everything we could and, and but the idea was this is a train that's leaving the station, partners, financial, whoever, get on, get on board or get out of the way. This thing is going to start this day. Get on and get out of the way. We're not waiting or nothing. So that was the mentality. Julian kind of saw that and wanted and applied that to, um, to God's country. And so we specifically wrote for the aesthetic. We, we specifically made the film a certain way to where it wouldn't be cost prohibitive you know, to make it like we weren't making a, a five million dollar movie. We weren't right. It looks like that way, but we weren't. We didn't approach like we're writing a ten million dollar movie or even a five million dollar movie. Um, we approached it as, as like, like again, make make the make the movie and the story, make it make the budget or whatever, make it your aesthetic. So we kind of had we approached it with that same mentality and like we we were able to find some fun. There was a. A colleague of Julian's that that actually uh, contributed uh, enough, a significant amount for us to like make the film in 2019. But at the time, we felt like that wasn't that wasn't enough to really make it the way we wanted to make it. So we just waited. We were like, let's wait a year and let's start going out to some. At the time, we were going to go with just like a, like a I hate to say the word like no name actors, but Un- I, unknown, unknown, yeah, non bankable, non bankable. Yeah, a non bank. There we go. 
<laughs> a non-bankable. Um, and we, we, I don't think we had even like decided yet, but we were like literally auditioning non-bankable actresses. But then we were like, you know what? Let's wait a year. Let's see if we can get if we can get some more financing, and then let's just go out to more bankable actresses, which is what we did. So we spent 2019 offering and 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 really not offering, but like looking to see if we could you know find a bankable actress, and we were able to connect with Cold Iron. Um, who ended up uh, being the, the production company on the film and ended up uh, bringing in, securing the financing to actually go make the film the way we wanted to make it. And actually working with Cold Iron, we were able, it, 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 the, the script went around and it got to uh, the hands of uh, Tandy's agent. And, Tandy, and Tandy's agent, Tandy Way's agent, reached out to us and was just like, this is really, we really like this. We think this, this could be good. But anyway, like, what are you, you know, are you, are you interested in her? Of course, we're like, yeah, of course. And so um, she read it and um, immediately connected with the material and cut to a few weeks later, like we were meeting, me and Julian were meeting with Tandy, Tandy Way, ironically at the same, literally the same bar where I met Julian in 2016. And we had the first, our first discussion that led to God's country. We ended up meeting with Tandy, like, literally at the same place. It was, like, all, like, kismet, serendipitous, as they say. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the financing, like, it was just, like, it really was, like, kind of two, two, it was, like, a private, uh, a, a friend of Julian's who was a really great guy that just really, like, like you know, supported us, supported what we were doing. He invested, and then it was, like, it was Cold Iron that kind of came in with the, the rest of the financing, and that was really it. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, I, I know you guys are going to have a, a really successful screenings over at, at Sundance and, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure it's going to find a home somewhere. I, I, I doubt that it won't. <laughs> I doubt that Fingers crossed. I <laughs> doubt that it won't find a home somewhere. So I think you guys are going to do just fine. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests, man. What advice? Sure. Would, and I think we've kind of talked about it. I'm going to ask it anyway. What advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business right now? Uh, one I've already mentioned, which is like um, network across. Try to find, try to find people that you can collaborate with that can get that you can actually make your stuff with. I mean, we've seen we've seen it happen with a lot of people who are major forces in the business right now. They collaborate with people who are on the same level as them, and they like we talked about, just work that muscle. And also, you're putting stuff out there, and when you put stuff out there, it has a value versus not, you know, just writing, you know. You know, writing a bunch of scripts. Yeah, you may get better as a writer, but at the end of the day, the goal is to get your work produced. So uh, I, I always say, network across. Um, and then the second one, I would say, take an acting class. I know this is like take an acting class mm -hmm. or act in something. Like for me, one of the greatest lessons I learned was from acting in the stuff that I was working on through the collective. Like in my in that collective, one of our guys is a director. He's always putting me in stuff. And he always had me playing like the same character, which is hilarious. And so like by acting in things, it helped me, it gave me different perspective, a different perspective on scene work. Like a good example was in like in Low Life, I wrote this huge monologue for like a, a character in the script, uh, in the movie. If anybody's seen a movie, like there's a character in the movie that has a, has a tattoo that's a pretty, uh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> pretty, like it's something, it's it, it, too offensive, offensive to a lot of people. But there was like a story behind it. And I wrote this like crazy monologue about what happened in jail and everything and why he got the tattoo. He's like, a, he's a recently released convict. And it was this cool monologue. And then we got on set and we realized like, this ain't working. Like, this is too much. Like, it was this huge monologue. And, I, and at that time, I got my actor hat on. I'm not, I'm no longer a writer. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I literally was just like, let's, let's cut it. Let's cut this, let's cut this monologue. And let's just make it a mystery. Let's just make it, let's just make it the entire movie that no one knows why he got this people will constantly be asking that question and it's going to like so much more yeah. push engagement. It's going to mm -hmm. push engagement for the audience. They'll be like, why does he have this that one? Like, and, because he seems like a really nice guy with this tattoo. And so like, <laughs> I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't had my actor hat on. Because my buddies who were in the, my buddies who were in the group that are writers, they were on set that day and they were like begging us not to cut this. They were like, Shane, we're like, no, 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 don't cut it, man. This is like, this is what the movie's about. I was like, nah, man, trust me. It's not worth it. Let's cut it. Let's go. And it ended up being like uh, a great decision that I, I think really like took the movie to a different level. So I 100 percent recommend take an acting class or act in something. Um, the funny thing is, I think a lot of writers probably originally wanted to act, but they either like they're 
we were generally like quiet people or they just they they don't have the chops or they or they, or they were afraid or whatever you want to say mm-hmm. but act like I, w- I would definitely like take at least just take an acting class i think it'll make you such a better writer and it also will help you with getting your stuff out there sure because you're gonna meet other actors you're gonna mm-hmm. meet other actors so you can you can work and 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 workshop your stuff yeah no question no, no question man i took an acting class and i've been an actor in and i hate it it's horrible <laughs> I, it makes you a better director too, because you really feel the empathy of what you're asking another performer to do. Because a lot of times directors just like just dance, man. Okay, dance. Like you know, just like move here, move there. Like and it's like you don't understand. They're open. You have to open yourself up. And oh, uh, dude, it's. Mm-mm, mm-mm. I highly recommend it for directors. Yes, please take an acting class or act because yeah, you kind of like they're human beings, not pieces on a chessboard. So you gotta like you gotta learn how to like how to like communicate and talk to them so absolutely yeah. now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film business or in life oh man i wish you would have gave me <laughs> that was the longest less um probably patience um yeah, that's mine i think i think as there's this mentality coming up and specifically with writers is that you just gotta like write a bunch of scripts you know what i mean you gotta write a million scripts and just keep putting stuff out there and keep pushing. And I, and I'm, and I'm the thing I've learned as I've, as I've grown in this business is it's about quality, not quantity. So like patience, whether it's like, instead of like going and jumping on something new, maybe like stepping away. Like I'm a big fan of like, if you're working on something, maybe step away from it for a little bit and go work on something else. And then return. don't just put it out there. Don't put something out there. Don't put something out there until it's ready. Um, and that's where the patience comes in. So, like, you may work on something, and you may think it's, like, pretty good, but maybe take a step back, step away from it, and then return to it and, and look at it again with fresh eyes. And you might see some things that, that you didn't see before that were, like, glaring issues that now, you know, the issues that weren't glaring before, but now that you read it with this fresh perspective, now they're, they're glaring issues. So patience is something that we had to deal with on God's Country because we literally had to wait a year to, 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 to finish the film. So I feel like in this industry... And in life, it's a marathon. It's a war of attrition. So just like you know, be patient, and and just like have some resolve. I think you, I think those are the things that will will carry you throughout this throughout this particular industry, throughout this particular experience. I think the business teaches you patience, man. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're you're gonna you're gonna learn you're gonna learn patience if you like it or if you don't like it because you're gonna get. A lot of like I always say, I got shrapnel, lots of it from this business, mm-hmm. you know, and that's uh, yeah. and that's but when you first come in, so when's the money coming? When am I getting my first job? When am I get like, yeah, it's not, it's just they just don't Even teach now, you that. I'm still learning that. Like, I'm a working, <laughs> I'm a working writer, I'm, I'm technically successful, and I'm still, I still have to learn pay. Even like, like when is this check coming? When is this check? And you just got to be like, look, man, this. <laughs> It's gonna come when it's come when it's gonna come. Like you don't you don't you don't control the world. Like don't, stop. You know? Don't push don't push the river. It flows on its own. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, um, three screenplays that every every screenwriter should read. Oh man, I get it. Okay. Shane Black's work. Mm-hmm. So let's go with um just to change black work period just let that that's changed, that, that's good yeah he changed the game like shane changed the game like he a screenwriter before shane was i think was this very kind of like stodgy formulaic kind of like you know really like not exciting you know the 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 read wasn't exciting it was about it was literally a blueprint for the movie and then shane came through and made and made the read entertaining so any of shane black's work I would say read Sorkin's work, maybe Social Network, Ugh. if you wanna if you wanna like read how dialogue can can push the scene, and be careful. Everybody thinks they Sorkin. Everybody thinks they're Tarantino. Everybody thinks they can write great dialogue. <laughs> no. like we all think that, and we, I'm sure we all we all can. I think I'm good at dialogue. But if you wanna like really like read how um, dialogue pushes a scene forward. Read, read Social Network, read Sorkin's work. And then I want to like, I think the default is Tarantino. Um, because but, he, again, but, but he's an anomaly, man. Like Tarantino yeah. is an, you can't write like, like all you could do is read Tarantino yeah. and just be depressed. 
Because <laughs> you're not yeah. going to write like him because nobody could write like him because he's Tarantino. Exactly, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why I don't want to do that because you're going to read Tarantino like and be like, man, I can't do that or think you can do that and then try to do that and really look bad trying to do that. So, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm trying to think like there's some good, there's some good like TV, um, some good TV scripts. I would say read. Um, oh, Breaking Bad. Just read Breaking Bad. Sp- oh, pilot. There you go. Yeah, read the pilot. Read the pilot to Breaking Bad. Read, yeah, as writers, read, read some pilots. There's some good pilots. Breaking Bad, I think Fargo. Uh, Fargo's a good a Sopranos, good Mad Men. Sopranos, Mad. Yeah, oh, uh, Six Feet Mad. Under. Six Feet Under. Oh. Six Feet Under. Read, like, the seminal television work that has, like, really changed the game. Read it. Like, read the pilots of Billions um, mm-hmm. if, if you can. You know, like, I, I, I try to read a lot of TV pilots when I can. They're, really, they're generally really good. And they're, they're good at setting things up. That's really what pilots are. Shay, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. I wish you nothing but success at Sundance and 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 keep doing what you're doing, brother. And thanks for being an inspiration to everybody listening, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been-